So uh, Isaiah 35, uh, 35, actually 34 is an interesting chapter. In fact, if you don't have this highlighted, the end of chapter 34, I encourage you to grab your Bibles and grab a highlighter and highlight the last two verses. It says in verse 16, it says, search from the book of the Lord and read. So search from what? The book of the Lord and read. So what is the book of the Lord? The Bible, right? God's Word, right? So search from the book of the Lord and read. Now in the Amplified, it says it a little bit better in the Amplified. But it says, none of these shall fail. Not one shall lack her mate. Not one what? The promises of God. So all the promises of God or Scripture begins to confirm Scripture. Each one has a what? A mate, right? And the Spirit has gathered them, and he has cast lots for them, and his hand is divided among them with the measuring line. They shall possess it forever from generation to generation they, that they shall dwell in it. Amen? Ver chapter 35. The wilderness and the wasteland will be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose, and it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. Right? So, and that's a prophetic picture. Chapter 35 is a great prophetic picture of revival. The desert shall uh, blossom, right? That which was dead shall come back to life, right? The desert shall blossom like the rose. In fact, I remember uh, I, I used to pastor. I started as a pastor for about seven and a half years. And I used to pastor in California. And Billy Brim came to our church. That's when I met Jim and all of this, 1991. And uh, so in 1991, Billy came to our church, and she was sharing this scripture. And as she read this scripture, she said, I just came from Israel, and for the first time in 6,000 years, the desert has blossomed like the rose. And what happened is, is in the desert there in Israel, it began to rain. And unbeknownst to anybody, there was hidden seeds in the ground, and when the rain touched it, it blossomed, and there was a picture on the front of the Tel Aviv newspaper, and it said, the, the, the desert has blossomed as the rose. And it showed how all of this, uh, it was just, it looked like fields of flowers, and it was actually the desert. <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? And so this is what we see is that this is what God is doing. He's looking for those who are broken. God is looking for those who have need, right? In fact, that's why when Jesus went and ministered to the Pharisees, he says, only they that are sick or those who have need have need of a physician. Is that right? And this is why many churches don't have revival in America and in Minnesota, because they don't see they have a need. They don't have any need. They have everything they could ever want. You understand? They know at 1102 what is going to take place. <laughs> I mean, they've got it planned out. Some churches literally have planned out for three years what every sermon will be preached. What every song will be sung. I'm telling you, I've met some of these pastors. I've met them. They know for years and years and years away. There's no room the Holy Spirit can't even move in his own church. Why? And so what has happened is, is that which looks good on the outside has actually become a desert. Amen. And that's the prophetic picture that we see of what our sister just said about Saul and David. Saul is a prophetic picture of dead religion that has no power. Dead religion with no power. We see the same thing is true in the book of Samuel. In the book of Samuel, we see Eli and Samuel. Eli has how many sons? Two sons. Uh, man, I can't remember their names again, but their names in the Hebrew mean this. It means sick and wasting away. That's what both their children, Eli's two kids, you look it up, both of his sons in, in, this is in 1 Samuel chapter 3, it mentions both of his sons, and as it does, you look up the meaning of their names, and the name of the one son was sick, and the other son's name was wasting away. <laughs> What are we going to name our children? Well, I was thinking about sick for the one, and I was thinking about wasting away for the second one, you know? 
Wow, can you imagine naming your kids that? But it was a prophetic sign. Why? Because here comes young Samuel, and the Bible says young Samuel began to hear the Lord. And that's the group of people that God is raising up here at Word of Life. Come on, somebody. He's raising up a people that will hear the Lord in the midst of dead religion. Come on, somebody. Amen? So the desert, shall it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. Come on, everyone, shout rejoice. It even says, even with joy and singing. Everyone say joy and singing. So, that's, so the Holy Spirit says, listen, this shall abundantly blossom, and it will blossom with those two elements, singing or worship and joy. And the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it in the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. And they shall see what? The glory of the Lord. So in other words, the glory that we were just speaking, show me your glory, show me your glory, shall be seen. What will it look like? It will look like joy and singing. Come on, somebody, right? So right there, it tells you right there, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Then he says, verse 3, strengthen the weak hands. So this is what happens in God's presence. This is what happens in God's kingdom. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, whew, I'm scared too. Oh, I must have misread that, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to see if you were listening, all right? Say to those who are fearful hearted, stay home. It's more important. Keep six foot of distance. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Say to those who are fearful hearted, what? Be strong in what? Do not fear, right? I remember last year, oh God help me. Right after I left your church, we went to minister in New York, up in Syracuse area. So we were ministering in Syracuse. We get to the church, and the pastor's got double masks on. And he looks like a deer in the headlights. He goes, you're not wearing a mask. I said, no, I know. <laughs> he goes, well, um, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. What, what are you going to do? I don't know. I mean, you know. and he says, but you don't have a mask. And I said, I know. He said, but the governor says you have to. I said, I know. I'll have a prison ministry then, I guess, you know, so. And so we get into the church. We get into the church. Now, I'm not even exaggerating this. There's about 140 to 150 people there. It was a healing service, and everyone's masked up. So they came, right? It's a healing service. And so I got, the Lord gave me a message called, you are the light, you are the salt, and, and, and you are a city set on a hill. And I just begin to talk about who you are in Christ. And I begin to talk about how we've gone and we've ministered healing to people like you've seen in the videos. We've prayed for people with full-blown HIV AIDS. Blood coming out of their eyeballs. Blood come out of both ears. Blood coming out of their nose. I mean, talk, I'm talking about blood, like a full flow of blood coming out of their mouth. And they hug on us. And we don't say, whoa, six feet of distance. Come on, somebody where we've ministered to people with uh, 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 leprosy. We've ministered to people with, with all these different diseases. Come on, somebody. Does anybody read the New Testament anymore? My Lord. I mean, how dumb can you get and still breathe? You know what I mean? So I preach this message on you are the salt, you are the light, and you are the city on the hill. And as I'm preaching, I kid you not, I promise before God Almighty, one after another, the masks begin to come off. Because I was saying to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Be strong, do not fear. And one by one, the masks came off. I said, if the church is afraid of the dark, my Lord, there's no hope for the world. If you think this little disease, you know. And you know what happened at the end of the services? There was only one person wearing a mask. Take a while, guess who it was? The pastor. He ended up quitting the ministry. I kid you not, I swear, I'm telling you right now, he is no longer in the ministry. And I'm telling you, there's a shaking going on. I said, there's a shaking going on. Now, I didn't think I was going to share along this line, so forgive me, all right? Is it all right? Okay. So say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong. Everyone shout, be strong. 
Say out loud, say, do not fear. It says, uh, behold, your God will come with vengeance and with the recompense of God. He'll come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. When? When the joy and the singing is triggered. Then it says, then the eyes of the blind will be open, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. Right? You know, here the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. I remember when we were ministering in um, uh, Sarnia, Ontario. You saw some photos from there. And it was Assembly of God Church there that we were invited to minister at. It's a long story. And uh, we were getting the left foot of fellowship from another Assembly's Church there in, in, in Toronto. And they heard about our revival meeting, so they invited us. And they had just gotten done with the 21-day fast. And so we went to the church to minister uh, in uh, uh, the week after Easter. And the pastor said, well, just come for one night. I said, no, I'm not your guy. We are not your ministry. We don't do the one-day meeting. That is not our ministry. You need to go find someone else if that's what you want. I said, we're here. We're believing God for a revival to bust out in this church. So he said, well, let's just do a few days then. So I said, all right. I said, just, you know, be open if God's moving and stuff. Let's keep going. So we ministered. There was about six, 700 people. And the first night, we had six deaf people completely healed in one meeting. Come on, somebody. Isn't that awesome? Just boom. I mean, and it just exploded. And we were supposed to be there three days, and we were there for 13 months. <laughs> Is that cool? <laughs> so for over a year, we were in that one church. It was just awesome to see the Lord uh, move. All right. So keep going with me. And then it says, the parched ground will become a pool, the thirsty land, lands of uh, springs of water, and the habitation of jackals where each lay there shall grass be with reeds and rushes. A highway will be there in a road, and it shall become a highway of holiness, and the unclean will not pass over, but it shall be for others, and whoever walks this road, though a fool, shall not go astray. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up on it. Uh, it shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransom to the Lord shall return. And now here, verse 10 is going to reiterate all the way back at the beginning. And it says, and they shall come to Zion with, they shall come with what? Ah, so in other words, worship will be a major part, and everlasting joy will be on their heads. In other words, everlasting joy will be on their thoughts. Everlasting joy shall be on their thoughts. It doesn't mean literally on their heads. He's speaking metaphorically here. So here he says, they'll come to Zion with singing, and the everlasting joy on their heads, and they'll obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Look over in chapter 55. Chapter 55 says quite a bit of the same thing in parts of it. But in verse 12, it says this. In Isaiah 55, verse 12, it says, For you shall go out with joy, joy ah, and you'll be led with peace. And the mountains and the hills will break forth into singing before you. Uh, there's singing again and joy. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Trees don't clap their hands because they don't have hands. So what's it speaking metaphorically of? The church, right? The people shall clap their hands, right? And instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name and everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. But you shall go out with joy. Joy. Again and again. Joy singing. Joy singing. Joy singing. Joy singing. And, and, and my sister had no idea what I was going to share tonight. But God began to speak to me about joy and singing. Joy and singing. Joy and worship more than ever before. In fact, I, I, I just spoke to an EMT guy from Arkansas. He told me in Arkansas in 2020 that suicide is up almost 7,000%. 7,000%. Are you ready for this one? In the state of Minnesota, it's up over 8,000%. More people, in fact, where there'd be two or three suicides a week, they're finding it eight times that amount of people 
Can you believe that? 20 some odd people a week. And I've talked to one after another after another. I've talked to uh, psychiatrists and psychologists that have come to our meetings and doctors, and they all say the same thing. Depression is on an all time high because of this whole lockdown and all of this stuff that, that the governments have done. And, and you understand all of this po political junk. Come on, somebody, right? And so, so how does the church break that? The church has to break that in the joy of the Lord. There has to be the joy of the Lord. There has to be a wave of the joy of the Lord. There has to be the joy of the Lord, the anointing of God, the anointing of God that breaks the yoke, right? Of depression, right? The anointing of God is, is the only thing that can break that. You know, many times what happens is, is it's easy when somebody is dealing with depression to look, all they look at is right here. This is it. Right, Pastor Mary? And, the, the, you know, and that's, you try to get them to lift their eyes. No, I can't lift my eyes. This is all I can see right here. And they won't lift their eyes. And what joy does is that joy gets their eyes off of what they've been depressed about. And it breaks that. And the joy of the Lord causes people to look up and all of a the sudden they can see the world again. Amen. Because you can go round and round. I just got a phone call from a gal from Florida. And she was depressed and all of this stuff and condemnation and all of this different stuff that she was going through. And she... She had backslid for all of these years, and now she came back to Christ, and she was afraid she committed the unpardonable sin, and blah, 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 blah. But it was just nothing but USDA condemnation. <laughs> she was just stamped with condemnation. And I'm trying to get her out. And she just, I, she could not lift her eyes up off of that condemnation. And consequently, what comes with condemnation? Depression. Is that right? So you can't have depression and joy at the same time. You understand? And so that's where the Lord begins to move. That's why historically we know this, that historically in every revival since the book of Acts, you can't name one revival that the joy of the Lord was not present. I mean, we could go back every 50 years, roughly, the Lord has moved in this nation. In the 1950s was the healing revival. People would break out in holy laughter and people would be healed. In the early 1900s was Azusa Street and the Topeka outpouring and stuff. And the joy of the Lord hit those people. Come on, somebody, right? Right here in the good old state of Minnesota. Did you know that we had a revival here in the state of Minnesota in 1877? In 1877, people were speaking in tongues in Moorhead, Minnesota. Did you know that? Yeah, excuse me, 1879. 1879, people were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, but there were a bunch of Swedes and couldn't speak English. And so then it jumped over to the, to the Norwegian people by the early 1900s. And then it went from Moorhead, it spread all the way down to Alexandria. You look at it historically, and in 1907, they had a revival there in Alexandria, Minnesota. Uh, and it was all, every single one of them talked about the joy of the Lord would hit people, people would speak in tongues. This is a historical fact, you know what I mean? And uh, um, in our country, let me see if I can find that again. I, I read this at our conference, and people couldn't believe it. Um, here in the state of Minnesota, how many uh, revivals that we've had uh, uh, break out and stuff. But here you go. Uh, anyone know that 18, uh, I got it mixed up. Excuse me. Excuse me, I got my dates mixed up. It was 1897. 1897 is when revival broke out amongst the Swedish people, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in 1877, did you know that there was a revival in the state of Minnesota? In 1877, it was the worst locust in, uh, infestation ever in American history. And it hit, it came, they came from Colorado, these uh, locusts, and there were millions and millions and millions of locusts. Uh, I'll, I'll just read some of this. This is from the Star Tribune. Excuse me, from the Pioneer Press, St. Paul Pioneer Press. I know it's shocking to hear that, but check this out. It went and said in 1877, it said there were so many, uh, uh, so many locusts that two-thirds of the state was completely covered with locust pods. It was equivalent to 50,000 of the state's 80,000 square miles. 
The locusts would attack cattle. Many of them would die from the blood poisoning. They ruined everything in someone's gardens, except for they didn't like peas. Nobody likes peas. So anyways, uh, <laughs> I don't for sure. And, uh, uh, but this locust infestation was so thick that there would be 60 to 80 grasshoppers in just one square yard. Many of the farmers would grab burlap bags and they would gather the locusts by the bushels. And some farmers would have tons and tons of bushels of, of, of burlap bags full of uh, these locusts. Well, it, it was uh, destroying uh, Minnesota agriculture. Obviously, people were leaving the state. And so what happened is that uh, the people said, um, we've tried everything else. Let us ask the governor to proclaim a day of prayer for deliverance from the plague. Could you imagine that one today? Is all free, right? <laughs> Unless God answers our prayer, we are ruined. This opinion even uh, was heard across the state. Hearing the requests of the citizenry, Governor John Pillsbury set aside April 26, 1877, a Thursday, as a day of fasting and prayer for the state of Minnesota. And on April 26 came, a hush fell over the state. Streets were empty, stores were closed, theaters and bars were dark. Only churches were filled as never before. Reports indicated that there was a beautiful, it was a beautiful, warm April day. And when the sun had set, many said, we've left it with the Lord and we can do no more. Then they went to their homes and they waited to see what would happen. Here's the account of the Pioneer Press for the next two days. Shortly after midnight on the morning of April 27th, ooh, I got goosebumps, the sky, the sky clouded over. Cold rain began to fall. The wind shifted from the south to the north, and the rain changed to heavy snow. All, uh, all that day, April 27th, with a few breaks, the storm raged, rain and snow alternating, and then frost covered the lands on the morning. And they hurried to the fields the next day, and with few exceptions, most of the uh, baby grasshopper eggs had been frozen and destroyed as they were hatching. Baby locusts died by the millions and millions from severe colds, uh, 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 from the severe cold. And uh, uh, so there was a, uh, the St. Saint, the Saint Paul Pioneer Press. Uh, with a joyful burst of good cheer and humor, Sunday, April 29th, another snowfall stung the same portion of the state and swept across Nebraska, Iowa, and Manitoba. There's never been a serious grasshopper infestation in all the years that followed April 26th of 1877. Come on, somebody. Never in the 100 and whatever that is, 50 or 40 years. Isn't that awesome? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Revival. Amen? It was a manifestation of the Spirit. You know, every time I started to say that, every single revival always was earmarked with those two things. Worship and joy. Everyone say worship and joy. I mean, you, they're in the early 1900s. In the, in the 1850s, the same thing happened in uh, Kentucky in the Cane Ridge revivals. They talked about the joy of the Lord would hit people. In the eight, early 1800s, uh, Charles Finney up in New York and New England and stuff, he would talk about people would get hit with hilarious joy. In the 1750s, they talked about uh, 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 Jonathan Edwards' wife would get so drunk in the Holy Ghost, they had to carry her out of the meetings. <laughs> I mean, John, uh, Jonathan... Uh, um, uh, uh, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, their wives would get so drunk in the spirit, they would have to set them down. <laughs> George Whitfield would have to tell people, come out of the trees, don't climb up in the trees to see, because the power of God's going to fall and you're all going to fall out of the trees. <laughs> come on, somebody. <laughs> they would start singing and worshiping the Lord and the joy of the Lord would come and people would get hit with hilarious joy. Now, I wrote this down, and you can write it down if you want to. I just thought it was really interesting that there's several things that happen when a person laughs. Now, these are not even up for debate. These are physiological things that happen in your physical body. There's eight things that happen when you laugh. Number one, you burn calories. How many of you want to burn calories? Ah, uh, then have a good laugh, right? So number one, you burn calories. There's a calorie, there's a caloric burning thing that takes place when you laugh. Number two, it relaxes you for over 45 minutes later. 
You actually relax. When you laugh, you actually are relaxed for more than 45 minutes in length afterwards. Number three, you bond with the people you laugh with. There's a bonding that takes place. You start to laugh, right? Number four, the brain opens up. The, it, I, they explain it. They said when a person laughs, a part of the brain begins to open up that was closed. Come on, somebody, right? Number five, laughter sends a wave of electricity through the brain that sweeps the entire cerebral, uh, cerebral cortex. So it sends a wave of electricity. Every laugh goes through like a wave of electricity, cleaning your brain. Number six, the immune system gets stronger. This is why doctors have learned that with patients that are dying, that are in the last stages of cancer, they start playing videos of the Three Stooges. And they just start laughing. Now, I'm not, this is not nothing spiritual, but when they start laughing, they usually end up living one to three months longer just from laughter. Isn't that amazing? Uh, number seven, your blood pressure drops. So if you have high blood pressure, your blood pressure comes down just by sheer laughter. How many of you think God knows what he's doing? Right? Number eight, you actually feel good because there's a re massive release of endorphins. <laughs> the moment you start laughing, there's a massive release of endorphins in your body. So literally, your body is healing itself just because you laughed. Now, I could tell you of hundreds of stories of revival in our meetings where we've seen where God has touched people like this with the joy of the Lord. I remember we were, first time I ever ministered in Canada was uh, in nor uh, northern Alberta. And we were ministering up there very close to a, a reservation. And these natives came from the reservation to the meetings. And one gal, she came. She was probably about 26. And as she did, uh, God kept touching her every night. And she would get hit with the joy of the Lord. In fact, I was just talking on Facebook with some people that were in those meetings in 1996. And so uh, the joy of the Lord it would hit these, uh, this woman. And she would just laugh uncontrollably. And she went and laughed in the, the floor of the service. Well, I went and I prayed for everyone in the church. And afterwards, it was, I don't know, it was probably 10, 10, 30, something like that. And so the pastor said, well, what do we do with this girl? I'm like, I don't know, just lock her in the church or something. I don't know. And, but she was laughing so hard, you guys. She was laughing so hard, she could not come out of it, right? And so I said, just leave the worship on and just, you know, shut the door and she'll get, she can go out whenever she wants. So the next day we come back to the church. She's still in the altar laughing her head off the next day. So we, said, we asked her later on, did you ever go home? She said, no, I just laughed all night long. She said, I couldn't stop laughing. So uh, she came back and she, she came to all of the meetings and stuff. And so the, uh, she began to testify. She said, when I was a teenager, my mother committed suicide by walking out and got drunk and she walked out in front of uh, a semi-tractor trailer and killed herself by walking in front of a tractor trailer truck and uh, killed herself. And uh, she said, I was devastated. I was a 16 year old girl. And she said, I was just so broken by that. And I had gone to psychiatrists, psychologists. She said, I was on all kinds of uh, drugs and the depression was so bad, she said, I just, she said, I would just sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. And someone invited me to the meetings. And she said, as soon as you prayed for me that first night, she said, I felt, it felt like the Spirit of God was pulling that depression out of me. And as it was coming out, it was replaced with joy. And she said, it was like, it was healing me as, as the other was coming out of me. And she was completely set free. Come on, right? We were ministering actually in an AFCM church out in California. We were ministering there and a lady, excuse me, this guy came and uh, he was dying of stomach cancer. Now he didn't tell anybody, uh, but he was dying of stomach cancer. And this night the Lord just said, just have a Holy Ghost service. And so I started laying hands on people and uh, uh, it was a little more structure, if you know what I'm saying. I'm saying it nicely. And uh, so I, I went in and, and I, I ministered to this guy. Power God hits this guy and he gets stuck in a trance at first. Now he's stuck in a trance and he can't move. 
And the more he tries to move, the more he starts laughing. Until finally he falls into a clump on the floor. And uh, then uh, as the meeting's going, I'm praying for all these people. And as I'm going around praying for these people, I see the guy get up and run out. of. And, and I could see, because it was a glass church, I could see him run into the men's room. And so I thought, man, that guy had to go to the bathroom or something. I don't know what his deal was, you know. And uh, so I just finished praying for people and stuff. And the joy of the Lord is hitting everybody in the building. And uh, this guy comes back over to my book table at the end of the service. And he's crying. And he said, you never prayed for me for healing. But he said, the moment you touched me, I felt the joy of the Lord hit me. And he said, I felt that cancer come out of me. And he said, I ran into the bathroom. I vomited the whole thing up. Come on, somebody. Isn't that awesome, huh? Everyone say joy and worship. I mean, I could tell you hundreds of stories like that. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I mean, we were there in, in Rosemount last October. Well, we were there September and October, but... Uh, because of the, the extended meeting. So we were there for those seven weeks. And someone brought that lady. Were you there when the lady with the broken back came? Yeah. So a lady came with a broken back. And uh, I laid hands on her. Power of God hit her. And she starts laughing uncontrollably. Right? And, uh, and so I just let the Lord just minister to her. And then I went and I ended up at the end of the service. I grew out her legs. And she was healed. And she was so excited. The next day, she was a, a Christian a motorcycle rider. And the next day, she and her husband got on a motorcycle and drove all the way to Arkansas and back in two days. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And here she had been suffering for I don't know how long it was with a broken spine. Come on, somebody. Is that awesome? And she ended up taking that, you know, that uh, whatever you call it. What was that thing? Uh, it was like a back brace or something. And I said, well, let's take it off. Let's see what God's doing. And she's like, well, it's going to take several minutes. I'm like, well, we're not going anywhere. You know, I mean, we're in the service, you know. Hallelujah. Everyone say joy and worship. Joy and worship. Amen. Praise God. The scripture talks about it again and again, right? Over and over and over again, the Bible talks about it. Look over in Revelation. I just thought of this. Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. It says, Then he opened the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven for a half an hour. And all the Baptists were thrilled. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I added the last little bit there. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel, now watch this, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense. What is incense? It's a prophetic picture of worship right because then it goes on to say and that he should gather it with the prayers of all the saints so the incense was a picture of worship and also he gathered it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar that was upon the throne and the smoke of the incense and the prayers out of this with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand then the angel took the censer filled it with fire everyone shout fire fire from the altar and he threw it back to the earth and there were noises thunderings lightnings and an earthquake so it was like the angel of the lord came and was gathering gathering worship now i've only heard god's audible voice twice in my whole life my whole christian life one time when i was in bible school in minneapolis and another time when i used to live in oklahoma and one night while I was up praying late, it was like 2 in the morning, I was up late, and I'm praying, and all of a sudden I heard the Lord say these words. He said, you say, April showers bring May flowers. Whew. Man, I'll tell you what, I jumped out of my skin. <laughs> you hear a voice in the air at 2 a.m., brother, all right? <laughs> and I said, oh, I mean, just the fear of God gripped me. I said, what, Lord? And he said, you say, April showers bring me flowers. Is that right? But he said, I say the fl your flowers of your worship that go up cause the showers to come down. 
the Lord flipped the whole thing. What was he saying? In other words, what goes up must come back down. Is that right? And that's what happens as we give, we pour our whole heart out to the Lord. Come on, somebody. What goes up? Some people are like, I didn't get anything. Yeah, because you didn't give anything. <laughs> Come on, somebody. The ones who complain the most are the ones that gave the least. You know, especially when the preacher talks about, you know, giving and what the Word of God says about giving. Man, he, I mean, if people just kept their mouths shut, no one would know the better. But the ones that get all mad, you ever notice somebody who's a giver? They're not never the ones who get upset. <laughs> we go to some churches. I, I purposely take time on the offering to offend people. I've had people get up and I remember one time this lady got up, walked out as I was teaching on the offering and she got up and walked out and she was going to slam the door and she stopped and she gave me the middle finger before she walked out. <laughs> she had a big old Bible under the other hand. <laughs> wow. Thank you, sister. I feel, I feel the spirit on that one. All right. <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? What goes up? What you give up comes back down. Amen? And that's what I believe that the Lord wants to do. He wants to do in our midst. Come on, somebody. Amen? <laughs> you want to see God do more in your life? Start to give more. Amen? Now, on the one hand, yeah, it's true biblically as far as, you know, money, yes. But it's also true in worship. Some people look like an old toad frog in a hailstorm during the war during the worship just blinking and looking around <laughs> come on somebody right but the moment they start to engage it's like something triggers on the inside of them come on somebody right some people i remember this one time i was here in minnesota it was out in marshall minnesota and uh they, these people got all offended with me. We had like five churches get together and we had a revival week. We held these revival meetings. And so they got all offended with me because I was talking about this different stuff, you know, about revival. And the one time I was doing the offering and uh, all the pastors had gotten together and we were all talking about what God was doing. And one guy was testifying and he was crying because someone got healed and Someone in his church, their marriage was saved. And we were there for eight days. This is uh, 1996. And uh, come to the last guy, and he was just eating soup, just like this. <laughs> just eating his soup. Now, all the other pastors are testifying except for him, right? So I know it's coming. <laughs> so, you know, they, a lot of religious people think that they're going to bug me. But they, I don't care. It doesn't bother me at all I because I'm going to hit them right square in the mouth, right? So, so I said, how about you, Pastor? And so he said, well, my people are all offended because of your teaching and stuff during the offering. He said, we have a box in the back of the church. If someone wants to give, that's how they can give. And I said, you know, I said, it's so funny you say that. Everyone got nervous when I said that. I said, it's so funny. I said, you know, when I came up here to Minnesota to minister, I flew on Delta. I said, I got to fly first class. Didn't cost me anything. There was a box in the back of the airplane. I said, you could give whatever you want to give. You could give a nickel, a dollar, and you could fly first class. Isn't that great? Now the other pastors are all eating their soup. They're like, holy crap. <laughs> and then I said, you know what? I took my wife to Red Lobster. I said, we just ate all the lobster we could eat. And they wouldn't give me a bill because that would offend me. I said, they, they just came and said, if you want to give something, there's a box at the door and stuff. Whatever you want to give. Isn't that nice? And it's, brother, I'm telling you, you could have heard a church mouse. I mean, it was silence there, right? And then I went and I said, the reason your people are offended is because none of them are saved. I swear that's what I said sitting at that table that day. I said, because the number one attribute of God is that of a giver. God so loved, he gave. Come on, somebody, right? He gave. God's a giver. Amen. 
God's a giver. And so if, if your, your people don't have that attribute of God, that means that they probably don't have him living on the inside of them. Come on. We were never asked back. I don't know why we were never invited back there to Marshall. But so, but, but I say this for this reason is this, is that I believe this is that the Lord is beckoning the church and saying, come on church, give up give up. Just begin to give me your whole heart. Begin to trust me. Come on, right? Just like the word tonight about, you know, you stand for yourself and you receive. Even like when I was laying hands on the sick, you place a demand. <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? I'll tell you what, I, I'll get other people to pray for me, but I'm not going to stand there like an old toad frog or something. I'm going to, brother, I'm going to place a demand on the gift of God inside that person. Come on, right? And, and I just learned that from Kenneth Hagin when I was a young Christian in the early 1980s about just placing a demand with my expectancy, with my faith. Come on, right? That's a mature way to go. Come on, somebody, right? But to just stand there and say, let's see what you got. <laughs> I mean, that is just a, a, a total defeated mentality. Come on, right? But I believe this is that the Lord is looking for a people. He's looking for you and I to be a worshiper. And he's also looking for us to be a people of joy. He's looking for us to be filled with joy. Filled with joy and laughter. Amen. You'll go out with joy. You'll be led forth with peace. Paul's last letter to, that he wrote before he was killed. The fourth chapter of Philippians. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, in other words, go back to joy. That's what rejoice means. Go back to joy. Yeah, but I had joy and I was filled with joy in 1999. Yeah, but it leaked out in 2000. <laughs> so you need to be filled again. Come on, somebody, right? You need to be filled again. You need to be filled again. And the more you begin to put yourself in that mindset, in that mind frame, amen, all of a sudden the joy of the Lord becomes dominant in your life instead of depression. Amen. So I believe this is that the Lord is given those fruits of the Spirit that live on the inside of us, but the anointing of God can stir those things up in us. The second fruit of the Spirit is... Number one is love, but number two is joy, right? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, right? In his presence is fullness of joy. When Jesus told the parable of the talents, he said, enter into the joy. Ah, right? So in other words, he was emphasizing joy. Some people today, they have no joy. They look like they've been sucking on an old pickle for about a year or something. <laughs> I think God has to send an angel down to ask him, what are you so serious about? I mean, they're just even more serious than God is. You know what I mean? It's... <laughs> Psalms 2 that says this, that he that sits in the heavens laughs. So God laughs. What do children do? Children laugh. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom. Is that right? What is a child? He's simple. You know, they say that an average child laughs almost 100 times a day. An average child laughs. They don't say, okay, now it's time to laugh. <laughs> but I can only laugh if it's in the spirit. You understand? Come on, talk to me here now. Some people are like, I'm afraid it's going to be the flesh. Hey, you brushed your teeth in the flesh. <laughs> We're happy about it. It's okay. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You brush your hair in the flesh. You put your clothes on in the flesh. Come on, so you came here in the flesh tonight. Is that right? I mean, so sometimes, you know, you, you have to maneuver. You know, it's just like this. It's like people getting filled with the Holy Spirit. I say this, give God something to work with. They sit there like, I mean, they're bolted down, brother. I'm not moving. In the name of Jesus, I'm not moving my mouth. God's got to shake the snot out of my tongue before I do it. <laughs> but how many of you notice that that's not how you got baptized in the Holy Spirit? You had to make the first. Is Come on, is this true? You made the first sound, right? 
When you got saved, did God just jerk your tongue out of your mouth and just now she's saved? No. How'd you get saved? Father, help, forgive me, right? Is that right? It was in the natural at first, right? It begins in the natural and you end in the spirit. You begin in the natural and you end in the spirit. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, sometimes we're asking the Spirit to do something that he's just saying, come on, just crank it over a little bit. <laughs> will, you, will you put that music on quietly for me? I remember as a kid, I was a city boy. My mom married a farmer, so we moved out to western Minnesota. <laughs> and so we move out to western Minnesota. So as we move out to western Minnesota, my stepdad had... We had two dogs and two horses. It was a, he was a grain, a grain farmer. So I remember that winter, I was nine. He said, I need you to water the horses. I'm a city boy, I'm, I'm from St. Paul. You want me to water down the horses? I don't know what that means. No, 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 you gotta give the horses water to drink. Oh, oh, okay, well where do I get it? He said, well there's a pump out there and I said, oh, okay. But it was like 25 below zero. So I go to the pump and I grab the pump and I pull it, nothing came out. So I shut it and I went inside the house and I said to my stepdad, I said, there's no water in that pump. He says, no silly, you gotta prime it, you gotta pump it and then the water will draw out. Is that right? So I had to learn how to pump it to get that water to come out. He said, there's plenty of water there. I said, no, there's no water. I opened it. I turned it on. Nothing. I stood there. It's cold out. Nothing's coming. He said, no, now go back out there, open it, and start priming it and watch. I'm telling you, brother, it was like a river just of water came. Amen? Guess what? The same thing is true on the inside of you. That sometimes you have to prime it, right? Sometimes you have to prime it. You have to force yourself in the spirit. Come on, somebody, right? You have to force yourself to do it. And as you do, you begin to push the spirit of God to flow out of the inside of you. Amen? Amen. Come on, just stretch your hands right now all over the house. Father, we thank you right now tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, <laughs> we drink of your presence tonight. Lord, we drink of your presence. We drink of your anointing. Lord, we drink of your power tonight. We say, Lord, tonight we, we prime the pump tonight of expectancy. We expect the river to flow, not to just be on the inside dormant, but the river to flow out of us as we prime it by faith. And so, Lord, right now, we just lift our hands in expectancy for that river of God, that river of joy, that river of God's presence to flow out of the inside of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.